you know that you need to use a couple of similes in your descriptive narrative writing piece. By the way, two is genuinely enough. However, are the ones that you use any good? This video will help you to reflect on how to use genuinely interesting, effective and thought-provoking similes and avoid rubbish, e.g. any similes referring to lions, hunting prey or ice. Stay tuned, this is Schofield on Shakespeare. This video will contain a series of cheeky challenges. You will be given two anonymised similes to think about. One from Edith Wharton's splendid 1907 novel, The Fruit of the Tree, and one from the writing of a past pupil. Then the fun will start. You will need to pause the video and decide which simile is likely to make an examiner weep and which simile is likely to make them beam. Let's get started. To quote macho man John McDonald prior to Peter Snakebite Wright's entrance into the arena, let's get this party started. Read the similes on screen now. Make bullet points on which simile is the most effective and why. It's pause time. The video will resume in five seconds time. Let's take each simile in turn. In the first one, I quite like the fact that a more interesting verb has been chosen. The voice is power down. However, I'm afraid that as soon as I see the word lion within a simile, I want to jump out the nearest window. I suspect at primary school, when pupils are first taught to use similes aged presumably about seven, the teacher uses examples of animals such as lions, cheetahs and tigers. However, at this level, English teachers get so, so tired of cliched similes about wild animals, it's much better to avoid them altogether. Additionally, the simile needs to add something to the sentence. The voices of children are compared to a single old lion. Is this effective? One slight issue is the use of children plural and just the one line singular. Presumably within these children there will be a number of different pitches, tones and other individual characteristics. Something which not, would not be the case within a single lion suddenly calming down ready to rest. That said, the reference to the line does give a hint about the volume and ferocity of the children's voices before, of course, they power down. But for me, the second simile taken from Edith Wharton's novel is so much more interesting and not just because it doesn't reference a bloody lion. It's so much more subtle and original. Essentially, it is saying that the friend has realised how stupid his comment was but doesn't want to say this directly. Instead, it is revealed through the fine smile. The reference to a magnifying glass suggests that the smile enlarges, accentuates the foolishness that the man feels about his comments. So, partly through this interesting simile, we also have an example of showing, not telling. A much less effective writer would have signposted the friend's feelings far more clearly e.g. a comment such as, don't be ridiculous, or body language such as, he rolled his eyes and smirked. Instead, we have the greater subtlety of the fine smile. Time for two more for you to get your teeth into. Make bullet point notes on which simile is the more effective and why. Yep, it's pause time. Oh my goodness, did you also weep at the reference to another wild animal? This time, wolves? The writer is presumably trying to suggest that he is feeling confined and claustrophobic. 
Yet can wolves ever give you a sense that they are figuratively attacking and devouring, however hemmed in you may feel? That said, I quite like the sound similarity of wolves and wolves. The use of paranomasia accentuates the link between the two different images and creates an appropriately claustrophobic effect. But I much prefer the first simile. Why? Well, I like the precision within the sentence as a whole. The crisp colon which ushers in more information about Justine's face. This simile illustrates that your sentence or phrase doesn't necessarily need to be long or complex in order to be effective. When the flame from a taper is put out, there is usually a miserable wisp of smoke left, a far cry from the power and glory of a flame. Thus, this simile, in an interesting original way, suggests that all the light and vibrancy has come out of poor dear Justine's face. Now for another two. Dear viewers, subscribers, and not forgetting, dedicated pupils. Read them and consider which one is the more effective. Why? Make brief notes. Pause time. The snow sounded like a drummer continually hitting his drum. Oh no. What else are blooming drummers going to be drumming? A tin pot? Whilst I quite like the fact that the simile emphasises the regular hitting or beating of the snow, presumably on a roof or some hard surface, the repetition of the word root drum is weak. Isn't the second simile beautiful? I love the sibilance within silken seaweed, which suggests that her hair is both gloriously soft, but also naturally tangled and a bit chaotic like seaweed. Indeed, this phrase seems to be oxymoronic in effect. Seaweed is not thought of as being soft to touch, rather slimy and sometimes brittle. This apparent contradiction makes the image more interesting. Also note how the sea imagery is extended. It is as though the girl's hair is being lifted on an invisible tide. Developing your imagery so that you reference related images helps build up a more consistent, effective picture. For example, don't just compare a loved one to a type of flower, say, but weave in references to buds, leaves, petals and stems as well. What do you make of these two similes? Which one is more effective? Why? Press pause to read, think, and make some notes. Another wild animal reference, this time a fox. Yes, I've no doubt that foxes have excellent hearing, but I've heard this simile or similar far too many times before for it to interest me or to have any real impact. That said, I like the detail of the sound of high heels hitting tarmac. Rather than just his mother approaching, this does create a reasonably vivid feeling of anticipation. The second simile requires some existing knowledge of Shakespeare's play King Lear. In this play, the silly old king asks his three daughters to publicly outdo each other in their professions of love towards him. His eldest two daughters, Goneril and Regan, play ball. The youngest, Cordelia, does not. And when asked what she has to say, simply responds, nothing, my lord. And then again, nothing. However, later events in the play demonstrate that beneath this apparent lack of cooperation and love, lay genuine deep feelings for her father. She just didn't want to participate in this tacky game or sully her love with unrealistic, over-the-top, public declarations. Thus, this incredibly concise, hyphenated simile, and I would recommend experimenting with these, actually says a great deal. It implies that Bessie's daughter, who has just made a Cordelia-like answer, does genuinely love her mother, irrespective of her mother's hurt reaction. It also implies that Bessie is being unreasonable and destructively self-indulgent in her behaviour. 
On the subject of concise, hyphenated similes, here are some other examples used in the novel, which I rather like. Press pause to read these now, and possibly jot down some you would like to add to your own collection. Two final similes for you to ponder, get your teeth into. Which one is the more interesting and effective? Why? Make some bullet point notes. It's pause time. What did you make of these two similes? Well, you know what I'm going to say about the second one. I hate lions in similes, and I particularly hate them roaring. Don't do it! The landlord isn't that hungry, and his pathetic voice will never be able to live up to that comparison. So let's explore the first example in a bit of detail. Essentially, it talks in the first half how Amherst would normally not react to his father-in-law. But at this particular moment, and with him in a particular mood, he can't help but erupt. Note the accurate use of the semicolon. Both before and after have the requisite main clause. And the simile itself? Well, this indicates how beneath his general demeanour there lies some repressed, angry feelings. Deep inside he already has slow-burning prejudices, meaning that it doesn't take a great deal for him to erupt. The spark of his father-in-law's irritating smug advice is sufficient to flame his resentment and cause it to come to the surface. Doesn't this sentence illustrate how imagery, when used carefully, can add real insight into feelings, people or situations. A mediocre writer would have just stated something about growing anger or possibly, God spare us, used a simile which referred to anger, anger coming alive like a lion faced with some prey. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, encouraging you to think more carefully about the similes that you use in your own writing. Many thanks for watching.